We now enter the next era of this project, one much more well documented than the previous, and I should mention right now, even though it's probably not necessary, that there is already a terrific documentary by Frank Pavich covering this very subject, Zhodorovsky's Dune, released in 2013. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. There are so many myths and legends surrounding this attempt by Alejandro Jodorowsky to adapt Dune that it's often difficult to determine what information isn't just sheer exaggeration. Pavich's documentary does an impressive job of sorting through it, and there's nothing quite like hearing the story told by the man himself. A movie like that sets a high standard. What I want to do here is provide something that serves as a kind of supplemental piece. A good portion of the information I'll be covering is also examined in Pavich's film, sometimes in greater depth and detail. I've tried to avoid repeating too much of that information while also exploring some interesting side roads and confronting some of the inconsistencies and contradictions as well, in order to make my video worth your time. I started work on this thing over two years ago, and just recently worked up the determination to finish it. I wasn't expecting this portion to turn out as long as it did, and I've debated shortening it or splitting it into multiple parts itself. Eventually, I just decided to hell with it. Let's go for broke. Hope you're all ready. Our last video left off in December of 1974, with a French consortium led by Jean-Paul Gabon and Michel Seydoux purchasing the rights to Dune from the Arthur P. Jacobs estate. Now already there's some murkiness here, a few sources seem to imply that the producers first obtained the rights independently, then chose to hire famed cult director Alejandro Jodorowsky to helm the project for them. But Jodorowsky tells a different story. According to him, the film came about as his own rather spontaneous decision. In an article Jodorowsky wrote for Metal Erlant, the original French version of Heavy Metal magazine, he claims to have been divinely ordered to make the film in a dream. Upon waking up from this dream, he went out, read the book for the first time in a single sitting, then contacted producer Michel Seydoux, a young, independently wealthy Parisian looking to break into the film industry. Seydoux had recently distributed the director's prior two films in France to great success, and wanted to personally produce Jodorowsky's next film. Jodorowsky told him his next film was Dune. Seydoux immediately purchased the rights. Now, Jodorowsky is nothing if not a master of cultivating a larger-than-life persona, so we'll have to be careful with how much we rely on him as a source. In reality, the project's inception might have been a bit more complicated. Information provided by the 2006 book Anarchy and Alchemy by Ben Cobb helps us to paint a more complete picture. Around 1974, Jodorowsky's relationship with his then-current producer, Alan Klein, famed manager of the Beatles, U.S. distributor of his breakthrough work El Topo, and key financier of his latest film, The Holy Mountain, was beginning to erode. The two were in complete disagreement over what the director's next career move should be. Up to this point, Jodorowsky was established as a countercultural icon, a controversial figure specializing in boldly transgressive material that earned praise for its daring brilliance and originality just as often as it was condemned for its excess and provocation. Jodorowsky was looking to switch gears. He wanted his next film to be a children's pirate movie, to be titled Mr. Blood and Ms. Bones. He planned to cast the film entirely with children, base the story on the historical journeys of St. Brendan the Navigator, and shoot the film on location in New York City. His ambition was to paint all the buildings in New York blue to represent the ocean, and film on a boat that he would tow through the streets. This idea actually bears a somewhat striking resemblance to a 1983 short film by Terry Gilliam called The Crimson Permanent Assurance, produced as an opening piece to the final Monty Python film, The Meaning of Life. The similarity is likely coincidental, since Gilliam's execution of the idea is very different. Mr. Blood and Ms. Bones did not seem to hold any appeal for Klein. He had other plans. 
the producer wanted to both capitalize on the notoriety generated by their previous work and jump into the newly exploding market for pornography. After the success of movies like Deep Throat and Behind the Green Door, X-rated films became, for a time, a surprisingly lucrative, quasi-mainstream business. These were the days before the internet, before videotape, when porno films were actually played in theaters. Klein had his sights set on an adaptation of an explicit and infamous 1954 S&M novel by Pauline Rayage, The Story of O. Jodorowsky remembers that Klein was already in the process of setting up the production in London when the director director decided he didn't want to be a part of it. He fled London and abandoned the production without telling Klein, a fateful decision that would lead to some harsh repercussions over the next few decades. But we'll go into that later. Newly jobless, needing a fresh project to devote himself to, Jodorowsky called up his friend Sedu, and when asked what film he wanted to make, Jodorowsky replied, Dune. He claims, in this version of events, that he hadn't even read the story when he gave that impromptu answer. He'd only heard a friend describe it. Perhaps it was destiny. Dune was undeniably a story that suited him. The themes and questions that obsessed Herbert equally obsessed Jodorowsky. Religion, mysticism, mythology, the expansion of consciousness, the fate of messiahs, the transcendence of men into gods. Everything was there, waiting for Jodorowsky to take it and run with it. Dune almost feels as if it was going to be the culmination of his entire life and career, the climax of his meteoric rise in the film industry. Born to Russian Jewish immigrants in Tokopia, Chile in 1929, Jodorowsky had had a difficult childhood. He experienced discrimination for being an immigrant. He was bullied by other children for his Jewish features. His father was abusive and domineering. From a young age, Jodorowsky would learn to lose himself in the arts. He devoured books and movies. He studied philosophy and psychology, as well as puppeteering and mime. He became involved in theater and the circus. He traveled to Paris in the 50s and wrote pantomime routines for the world-famous Marcel Marceau. He dabbled in just about every artistic pursuit imaginable. In 1960, Jodorowsky moved to Mexico City and devoted himself to his theater work, founding a surrealist theater movement called Panic and putting on hundreds of plays. It was here that Jodorowsky discovered a talent for provocation. The panic performances saw him pushing as many boundaries as he could, attracting enormous controversy and a great deal of media attention. Shows would routinely feature women being stripped naked and live animals being sacrificed. Just for starters, those panic performances would inspire Jodorowsky to make his first feature film. He had already directed a short during his time in France, a silent mime piece inspired by a Thomas Mann novella called La Cravate. Ten years later, he would make Fando y Lis. Conceived within the panic theater idiom, Fando y Lis, loosely based on a play by Fernando Arabal, was an episodic, extremely low budget, and very radical surrealist experiment, following a young man and woman through a dreamlike post apocalyptic world on a search for the last remaining city in existence called Tar which may only be imaginary. Filled with religious symbolism, featuring scenes of incest and cannibalism, the film caused an immediate scandal at its premiere at the Acapulco Film Festival. It said the reaction was so furious that a full-scale riot broke out, resulting in the film being banned outright in Mexico. Jodorowsky discovered his true calling. This was how he was going to take the ideas he had developed on stage to the next level. Despite the outrage, or maybe because of it, Fando Elis wound up being a boon to his career, affording him the opportunity to make a more ambitious follow-up. His second film, the metaphysical acid western El Topo, would showcase a higher degree of technical polish, an even more relentless assault of shocking imagery, and an even more overt spiritual tone. Drawing inspiration from the Bible, Zen Buddhism, 
Taoism, Sufi mysticism, Hinduism, the writings of Carl Jung and Friedrich Nietzsche, and his experiences studying meditation and karate, Jodorowsky layered the film with a dense array of religious symbols and philosophical insights. This ultra-violent allegory, which followed a brutal gunslinger through an endless desert on an unlikely journey towards enlightenment, was also a very personal reflection of its director's own search for meaning and fundamental truth. I see it as the moment that Jodorowsky started turning his art into a means of self-discovery. El Topo was booked into a single New York theater in 1970, The Elgin, run by Ben Barinholtz, and thanks to astonished word of mouth, it would play every night at midnight to packed houses for almost a full year. The film is widely credited with spawning the midnight movie phenomenon of the 70s and opening the doors to a future wave of underground artists like John Waters, George A. Romero, and, interestingly, David Lynch. A whole subculture formed around films that celebrated the bizarre, the outrageous, and or the disturbing. It launched careers and inspired a rediscovery of artists like Todd Browning and Ed Wood, the epitome of this movement was arguably the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which to this day continues to almost single-handedly keep the midnight movie tradition alive. The 1983 book Midnight Movies by Jay Hoberman and Jonathan Rosenbaum functions as a great historical document of this era and helps to give us an idea of the colossal impact felt by Jodorowsky's arrival. El Topo divided critics and became a cultural touchstone for the contemporary artistic community. Jodorowsky was hailed as a genius by some of the most influential figures of the time. He started hanging out with the likes of Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper at BBS Studios when they were in the process of changing the American film industry after the groundbreaking success of Easy Rider. Jodorowsky even helped Hopper edit the final cut of his disastrous avant-garde follow-up, The Last Movie. John Lennon and Yoko Ono famously declared El Topo their favorite movie, catapulting into prominence. Lennon is said to be the one who convinced Beatles manager Alan Klein to purchase the film for distribution in the United States, under his Abco Films banner. Jodorowsky's charisma and intense idiosyncrasy drew people around him magnetically. He was equal parts shaman and showman, once declaring that he wanted to be the Cecil B. DeMille of the underground. His status quickly elevated beyond that of a mere filmmaker. He became regarded as something of a prophet, worshipped by a religiously devoted following. His third film, The Holy Mountain, took this status to its apotheosis. His stated ambition, was nothing less than to create a film that would function as a holy text, a film that would do for cinema what the Bible did for literature. Given total creative freedom with a budget around $1 million, put up largely by Alan Klein, Jodorowsky prepared for this production by studying yoga, undergoing sleep deprivation classes, spending time in an isolation tank, and experimenting with LSD. His story took inspiration from The Tarot, The History of Alchemy, a 1952 novel by René Dommal called Mount Analog and so much more. He designed and constructed elaborate sets, shot the film in anamorphic widescreen, and populated his cast with non-actors. After original star George Harrison dropped out due to the film's extensive nudity, these actors would undergo much of the same training Jodorowsky put himself through, and the filming process pushed them to exceed their every inner limit. Several sequences were filmed under under the influence of LSD, and not always with Jodorowsky's knowledge, sometimes resulting in the cast experiencing fictional scenes as if they were reality. The Holy Mountain is an indescribable experience, 
One of those movies that basically exists in a genre all its own. It's part fantasy, part comedy, part drama, part psychic quest, following a large group of characters on a mission to scale a mythic mountain in order to become gods. It's filled with the most astounding imagery Jodorowsky ever created, and rides an indistinguishable line between profundity and incoherence from start to finish. This is a line Jodorowsky always rides, but the heights he takes it to in Holy Mountain are dizzying, even for him. The film premiered at the 1973 Cannes Film Festival, and though it failed to make the same kind of impact as El Topo, it enjoyed a more than healthy run on the midnight circuit, playing for 16 straight months. The reaction from the critics was more polarized than ever. It was beloved and loathed in equal measure. Jodorowsky's status as the most radical artist of his time was cemented. Looking back on these movies for this video, what was most surprising to me about them was that, while they would be interesting simply as time capsules of 70s sensibilities, they actually hold up as mesmerizing and visionary works. They're alive with energy and imagination, thrillingly exploring the limits of cinematic form. They resonate with something rare and inimitable, the force of a distinct personality, putting all he has to give into his work. With divine ambitions, his productions have always been driven by an urgent sense of purpose. There was no limit to which he was not willing to go. There was nothing he was not willing to risk. The film at hand was important above all. This mentality can inspire fantastic achievements, but it can also easily be used to justify some just plain wrong behavior. His films do feature scenes of animal cruelty that are difficult to watch, and there's a scene of sexual assault in El Topo which Jodorowsky claimed at the time was done for real. He has since denied the authenticity of this scene, and says now he made those statements only in an effort to attract controversy, pointing out that, as a Latin artist trying to break into the American market, there were very few opportunities available to him. Controversy was his most valuable asset in competing with big studios. Naturally, times have changed, and claims of abusing women, even if they are false, are no longer acceptable. Not that they ever were acceptable, but in the 70s, outrageousness was appreciated for outrageousness's sake. That was a major part of the midnight movie underground. Shock. Provoke. Offend the mainstream. A lot of times, that ethos was taken too far. And often, it was women who got hurt. This makes it a lot harder to study and appreciate films like this in the 21st century. The uglier side of that world is a difficult thing to confront. Jodorowsky's comments especially will turn plenty of people off to his work. And that's fine. I don't want to defend comments like that. I only want to give his work a context. Because whether we like it or not, it holds a significant place in film history. By the end of 1974, riding high on his fame, Jodorowsky and his family had moved to Paris, and he had begun work on adapting Dune. It was to be his grandest vision yet. Jodorowsky's script deviated considerably from Herbert's text, infusing the material with his own singular, fervid imagination. His version of Dune, like his other films, was planned as a violent, sexual, blasphemous, humorous, taboo-breaking, hallucinatory epic. A lot of the original storyboards and a pretty detailed summary can be found on duneinfo.com. Their breakdown is taken from several different versions of the script that have surfaced, and taken together with the Jodorowsky's Dune documentary, we can actually develop a pretty good idea of what the film would have been like. In the documentary, it's mentioned that the opening was planned as a huge, unbroken shot that moves through an entire 
entire galaxy. But according to the Dune Info summary, this concept might have actually developed later in the production. Storyboards from an original 1975 press kit show a different opening, one in which we see a race of canine aliens entering a sort of mausoleum. The aliens then watch a film on the history of humanity projected by a robot crucifix. This functions as a prologue, introducing us to Dune's world. We learn that the Earth was destroyed over 20,000 years ago, man expanded to populate all the planets in the galaxy, and eventually there was a revolution against machines that restructured society. We also learn the properties of the spice, as well as the history of the Bene Gesserit, and the rise of the Padishah Emperor. As the story proper begins, Duke Leto is investigating a spice smuggling ring. He discovers the Harkonnens are behind it and informs the Emperor. The Emperor, in order to hide his own role in the smuggling ring, awards control over Arrakis to House Atreides. Duke Leto begins preparing to move his family to Arrakis, while in the meantime we learn through flashbacks that he was castrated in combat years ago. Lady Jessica was able to circumvent this little problem using her powers impregnating herself with a drop of his blood, and later giving birth to Paul. Scenes follow, setting up Paul's incredible powers and potential, the Harkonnen plot to assassinate the Duke, the Atreides move to Arrakis, and the first meetings with the Fremen. Even the most familiar plot elements from the novel so far are interpreted with a very Jodorowskian touch. The Emperor meets with the Duke in an upside-down room, complete with a giraffe on the ceiling. The Harkonnens are introduced in an orgy scene. At one point, we see a man wrestling a hippopotamus. Most notably, when the Atreides first arrive on Arrakis, it's following a sequence where the Harkonnens horrifically slaughter nearly everyone in the main palace. This sequence would have concluded with a scene where every Harkonnen soldier is then ordered to defecate on the floor of the palace. Jodorowsky is said to have planned filming 2,000 extras actually defecating on screen. From here, the script more or less appears to follow the book pretty closely. Duke Leto takes control of the planet and begins weeding out the corruption he discovers, earning the respect of the Fremen along the way. But it's not long before the Harkonnens are back and springing their trap. The Atreides forces are massacred, Paul and Jessica escape into the desert, and Duke Leto is taken prisoner. After torture, reducing him to only a head and torso, Leto breaks open a secret poison tooth in an attempt to kill the Baron, and fails. Paul and Jessica join with the Fremen, Paul is possessed by prophetic visions after being exposed to the spice, and training begins to take the planet back from the Harkonnens. Paul is renamed Muad'Dib, and four years later, he is leading the Fremen in battle as their long-awaited prophet, the Lisan al-Gaib. When their fight to take back Arrakis begins to succeed, the Emperor is prompted to intervene. He and the Baron Harkonnen arrive in person to restore order with their armies, and in a final showdown, the Baron is killed, the Emperor's forces are defeated, and Paul fights a one-on-one -on -one duel with Fade Rautha, the Baron's ruthless nephew. Paul wins the duel, but is poisoned. As he dies, Paul claims that the Kwisatz Haderach lives in everyone, that he is the collective man. All of the Fremen begin speaking in Paul's voice, saying, I'm Muad'Dib. Later storyboards for this ending take it even further. Paul's throat is cut, he dies right there, and then his voice starts coming from all the Fremen. The entire planet of Arrakis is then transformed into a lush oasis, becoming a collective consciousness itself, and leaves the galaxy to spread enlightenment to all living beings. The original script then ends with an epilogue where we return to the canine aliens and realize that the entire movie was part of the History of Humanity film projection. The robot crucifix's head explodes, the aliens leave the projection room, and lament the fact that their masters will never return. But as their ship leaves the planet, it's decided that one day they may go looking for them.
It seems many elements would be added to this script as the production developed, some of which I'll cover as they pop up. Others, like the prologue and epilogue, appear to have been dropped. Jodorowsky finished work on the initial draft of the script astonishingly quickly, after only about two months. Immediately afterwards, working at the same extraordinary pace, he began assembling a production team of some of the most talented artists in the world. Jodorowsky remembers working on this film in a kind of fevered trance, surrendering himself to a higher power. Most of his collaborators would fall under the same spell. First to join the team was Jean Giraud, known in the comic book industry as Mobius. Jodorowsky hired the illustrator after stumbling across one of his comic books and relied on him to create over 3,000 drawings, meticulously storyboarding the entire film, from the first shot to the last. The scale of the film was insanely ambitious. What Jodorowsky wanted to achieve appeared so far beyond the capabilities of the time. Many wonder how he could have possibly done it, given the technological limitations he was facing. Dune was going to be huge, perhaps the biggest, most expensive film of all time. Facing an enormous special effects challenge, Jodorowsky first contacted the genius behind the groundbreaking effects of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, Douglas Trumbull. After a few meetings with Trumbull, Jodorowsky decided against hiring him. In his view, Trumbull was too pragmatic, too lacking in spirituality, and too expensive. Just about this same time, the director happened to catch a screening at a science fiction film festival of a goofy and inventive little comedy put together by students at USC, Dark Star. In the credits, he spotted the name Dan O'Bannon. Dark Star had begun as a short film, written by O'Bannon and his friend and classmate, John Carpenter. They made it with about $6,000 they were able to scrape together. Carpenter directed, and O'Bannon designed the special effects. The short achieved considerable success during their time at USC, and later, they were given funds to expand it into a feature. The finished film cost about 60 grand, and it launched both Carpenter's and O'Bannon's careers when it was given a theatrical distribution. Carpenter went on to direct the iconic Halloween and other cult classics, and O'Bannon was offered a job on Dune. Jodorowsky had been impressed by Dark Star's ingenious low-budget effects. He wanted O'Bannon to be his special effects designer for the entire Dune production. A massive responsibility. O'Bannon dropped everything and moved to Paris to accept the job. Finally, the design team was rounded out by Chris Foss, a British artist renowned for his cover designs for science fiction books, and noteworthy as the illustrator for the sex manual, The Joy of Sex. Again, Jodorowsky stumbled across his work by chance, fell in love with it, and tracked the artist down. Foss would design the film's spaceships, vehicles, and hardware. Jodorowsky, in all of these design elements, was adamant about emphasizing imagination over realism. He wanted every design to be as elaborate and stylized as possible. In his vision, machines should feel like living creatures. Sets and costumes should act as baroque extensions of the characters. Dune would go against the standard expectations for sci-fi. The whole team worked ceaselessly for four straight months in late 1975. No expense was spared on facilities or equipment. Endless designs for sets, costumes, effects, and more were all created in this time. The artists involved recall the period as a deliriously fertile creative frenzy. Under Jodorowsky's enthusiastic leadership, they all felt a part of something truly special. While overseeing his crew, Jodorowsky was simultaneously assembling his cast, one characteristically eclectic and inspired. David Carradine was in talks for Duke Leto. There were rumors that Mick Jagger would play Fade Rautha and Elaine Delon would play Duncan Idaho. Roles were allegedly offered to Udo Kier and Gloria Swanson. Jodorowsky wanted Charlotte Rampling for Lady Jessica, but she is said to have turned down the role. 
Later, Geraldine Chaplin was attached to the part. His son, Brontus Jodorowsky, would portray the hero, Paul Atreides. Brontus would spend months in intense training with weapons and martial arts experts to prepare for the role. Orson Welles was cast as the Baron Harkonnen after Jodorowsky promised to hire a personal chef for him. Most famously, Salvador Dali agreed to play the Emperor with the character heavily rewritten to suit his demands. This emperor would be insane, living in a citadel made of pure gold. Dali allegedly wanted to be filmed in every scene sitting atop a giant toilet, designed in the shape of two dolphins, one to receive urine, the other to receive feces. He expected an explicit close-up showing the toilets being used though requested that it be filmed with a double. Jodorowsky claims Dali even drew a design for this toilet himself, for use in the production. Before signing on to the film, not only did Dali state he would refuse all direction and require permission to be able to do whatever he wanted, his salary was going to be $100,000 an hour which would have made him the highest paid actor in history up to that point. To accommodate these demands, Jodorowsky deleted most of the Emperor's scenes from the script, reducing Dali's material to only a page and a half, to be filmed in a single day, in a single hour. An hour that would cost $100,000. The rest of the movie, Jodorowsky planned to film with a dummy sculpted from Dali's likeness, which would be explained as the Mad Emperor's decoy. It was during a meeting with Dali that Jodorowsky was introduced to the work of H.R. Giger, a supernaturally gifted Swiss artist gaining popularity for his surreal and disturbing aesthetic. The director was immediately taken with what he saw and contacted Giger, envisioning him as the designer for the Harkonnen homeworld, Getty Prime. Surprisingly, at least according to Giger, the artist seems to have never been made a key member of the team. He claims to have done his work separately in his native Switzerland, and that he was required to submit his designs to the production for approval, his one concession being that he had the same creative freedom as the rest of the team. No less striking were the artists Jodorowsky assembled for the film's soundtrack. Each planet would be granted not only its own unique look, but also its own unique sound. Pink Floyd would contribute the music for House Atreides as well as the majority of the soundtrack. Jodorowsky met with them as they were recording Dark Side of the Moon in Abbey Road Studios. Other artists included Magma, who would score House Harkonnen, and agreements were made with Virgin Records to hire Gong, Mike Oldfield, and Tangerine Dream. The film was planned to be shot in 70mm, on location in Algiers, with an actual guerrilla warfare expert from South America acting as a consultant on the battle scenes. Estimates on the movie's eventual runtime vary wildly. Some say the finished film would have clocked in at a mere 3 hours. Others insist 10. Still others believe it might have ended up being 14 hours long. Frank Herbert himself claimed that Jodorowsky's script would have made an 11 or 12 hour movie. It was the size of a phone book. Speaking of Herbert, the author doesn't appear to have been much involved in this particular freewheeling effort to adapt his book. Comments he made a few years later appear to indicate that while he didn't quite understand Jodorowsky's interpretation, he did remember the director with humor and fondness, stating his script was pretty anti-Catholic. I used to kid Alejandro about that. I told him that his biggest disappointment in writing the script was probably not finding a way to horsewhip the Pope in it. Dune was getting tantalizingly close to principal photography, but, alas, the production suddenly lost its favor with the film gods. The tragic end of Jodorowsky's Dune is where the story gets most confusing, because so many different sources seem to indicate different reasons for the cancellation. The one thing we appear to know for a fact was that the production adjourned for a Christmas break in 1975 and never reassembled. Why? Well, 
let's look at the possibilities. The main reason for the holiday break appears to have been an effort to deal with the film's most pressing problem, financing. Most every story of the project's collapse agrees that it was money that caused the downfall. Either not enough of it, or sheer panic at the overruns being accumulated. One way to read it is that Zhodorovsky went out of control, that the man totally lost touch with reality as his vision grew too enormous. The film had indeed proceeded recklessly through its development process. Nearly two million dollars is said to have been spent just in pre-production. Who knows how high the final cost would have been. Budget estimates run from nine to over 20 million dollars, some even higher. Perhaps Zhodorovsky's ego did indeed collapse under its own weight, taking Dune with it. Most of these estimates, however, appear to have been exaggerated. Contrary to the film's reputation as potentially the biggest and most expensive of all time, the budget, according to Michel Seydoux, in Jodorowsky's Dune was set at $15 million. To put that kind of budget into perspective, compare it with Cleopatra. This was the most expensive movie ever made up to that point. It cost somewhere between $30 and $40 million. That was in 1963. Dune was being put together in 1975. The most expensive movie produced the year before was The Towering Inferno, which cost $14 million. One of the most expensive movies of that same year was Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, which cost $12 million. The most expensive movie the year after was the remake of King Kong, which cost a little over $20 million. Not to get ahead of myself, but King Kong's producer, Dino De Laurentiis, will play a pretty important role in the next video. Looking at all those numbers, we can see $15 million would have been high, especially for an independent production in the 70s, but not unprecedented. The stories of Jodorowsky spiraling out of control may not be all that accurate. His approach to Dune actually seems to have been surprisingly organized. Let's not forget, Jodorowsky came from the world of low-budget filmmaking, where organization is key, where one must constantly resolve ambition with actual physical means. All his previous films, from Fando y Lis to The Holy Mountain, were much larger in their initial concepts, and evolved during filming according to what was achievable under the circumstances. That's where creativity itself is born, at the point where vision conflicts with reality. True, certain things in Dune were likely beyond the capabilities of the time, but this is a challenge that film productions often face. It's how innovation happens. I mean, if Dan O'Bannon could do what he did with Dark Star on a couple thousand dollars, who knows what he could have done with a few million at his disposal. Still, I don't think anyone was expecting that Dune would turn out exactly the way the storyboards planned. That was just a blueprint. More than that, Jodorowsky seems to have realized that compromises were in order if he was going to be tackling something this big. There's evidence to suggest he began toning down his original X-rated plans at some point. The finished storyboards apparently omit many of the most shocking scenes in the script, and H.R. Giger even remembered that his one restriction during the production was not to show nudity. According to him, Jodorowsky wanted to avoid the censorship problems that had plagued his previous films. That would appear to indicate the director was approaching this project realistically. In fact, the crux of his budgetary issues seems to have stemmed from the very practical matter of distribution. According to Jodorowsky, in interviews published in The Greatest Sci-Fi Movies Never Made by David Hughes, the film was initially being funded entirely with French sources, and they actually had enough to make it happen. At a certain point, though, they realized what they didn't have was the means to distribute the film on a large enough scale to allow for a potential profit. Michel Seydoux confirms this in a deleted scene on the Blu-ray for Jodorowsky's Dune, saying that without American distribution, their film would have been seen as competition, and therefore would have likely been blocked from reaching most theater screens in the US. If Dune was ever going to happen, it would have to be as a French-American co-production. 
Otherwise, the financial risk was too great. Sedou says their plan was to keep most of the budget in place in France, except for the last five million dollars. A plan was put together to raise that last five million. Jodorowsky compiled a gigantic tome of all their work thus far, and sent copies of it to every studio in Hollywood. This volume featured the most recent draft of the screenplay, the entire collection of storyboards, every piece of concept art and costume design, a complete breakdown of the story, the characters, the effects, the sets, the models, a complete plan for how the movie would be built and shot. This kind of thing is called a proof of concept, and although it was apparently uncommon at the time, it has since become almost a standard practice in the film industry. Looking at all that incredible artwork and these amazing concepts, who could say no? Turns out, everyone. I think now we're starting to arrive at the real reason this movie died. Due to its size, it couldn't be done independently. But due to its unconventional nature, it couldn't find acceptance at a studio, even with a mere $5 million asking price. That makes it very tempting to put all the blame on the stupidity and greed of the Hollywood studio system. I think that would be far too easy. In my mind, it's a little more complicated. I mean, let's try to really think about this from all perspectives. Let's really think about how risky a project like this was. First off, consider the timing. Large-scale sci-fi remained a rarity in the 70s. Sci-fi was popular, but almost always under limited budgets. About the only exception to this was Kubrick's 2001. And since Kubrick pretty much existed in a league all his own, no other director had yet managed to do something on the same level. Star Wars was still a few years away. Second, consider the risk. Jodorowsky, although a visionary, was not Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick had the rare privilege of being a filmmaker that could attract a box office return on name recognition alone. That was a privilege he had spent years earning. Jodorowsky, by comparison, was underground. He was successful, but on a smaller scale, and in a very specific market. Dune represented a huge leap up in terms of size. He had never attempted something this big before. That's a tremendous risk, and it's not unreasonable for a studio to be worried about something like that. Who's to say the project's more peculiar aspects didn't remind a few executives of the recent disaster Zardoz? True, in the 70s, auteurs did have unprecedented power. That probably gave Dune better odds. But auteurs still tended to work with smaller budgets. When they did tackle something bigger, it was only after a major box office success. Which brings us to the final factor, Jodorowsky's artistic temperament. He's never had much patience for commerce. He's good at selling himself, an essential skill for elbowing your way into Hollywood, but in order to stay there, you also have to be willing to grapple with the numbers, to say you can work with X amount of dollars and guarantee X amount of return. Such is the nature of the business. Major American filmmakers tend to take this as a fact of existence. They know how to deliver the numbers that get their movies made. In the case of Jodorowsky, I think he quickly became frustrated with that mentality. I'm not saying he's wrong to be artistically minded, I'm just saying it's a waste of time to get mad at the industry for being concerned with profits. It's how an industry works. Assuming that certain artists are somehow entitled to the resources of that industry is foolish and naive. I do think that Hollywood, to this day about the only place with the kind of infrastructure necessary for films above a certain size, exerts far too much influence over the film industry in general, though streaming is starting to change that. And I'm not going to deny that studios have a track record of conspiring against artists. That's a very real problem, even in this new world of streaming. 
But let's not forget, artists also have a history of conspiring against themselves. After all, it was hubris, not Hollywood, that killed the auteur movement of the 70s. When you get right down to it, I don't think this is a story of heroes and villains. Nobody's completely right or wrong here. Jodorowsky, though he could hang with the Mavericks on the fringe, could not find a way to fit himself into the studio mold. His Dune, too unorthodox to be a Hollywood production, too expensive to be an independent production, simply represents a case of two very different worlds clashing, and in this case, failing to resolve that clash. That's all. Even if we were to speculate and alter any of the surrounding factors, it would spoil the project's mystique. For instance, if it had come a few years later, after Star Wars, when studios were eager to greenlight any sci-fi project, it wouldn't be famous as the sci-fi blockbuster that predates THE sci-fi blockbuster. If it had been just a little less ambitious, or if Jodorowsky had been more in tune with the studios, more willing to compromise for funding, it wouldn't have that same aura of impossible romance. The fact that it did come so unbelievably close to happening is nothing short of a miracle. And if it had happened, would it have completely revolutionized the industry, as some like to claim? Well, maybe. But it's equally possible it could have flopped. Once again, I'm just trying to be fair and realistic. There's no way of knowing what kind of impact this film would have had. I'm sure it would have been remarkable in a number of ways. I'm sure it would have attracted a sizable cult following. I know I would have liked to have seen it. But more than that, we can't really say. What we can examine is the impact the film had in the wake of its death. Dune's cancellation left its entire team devastated. So much had been invested in it. Not just money and resources, everyone had put their faith in this movie. Now that it was gone, what would they do? Some, like Chris Foss, were lucky. He was so busy doing design work for Planet Krypton and Superman the movie that he was one of the last to find out Dune had been cancelled. In 1980, he was hired by, ah, here he is again, Dino De Laurentiis to redesign Flash Gordon's rocket cycle. Sadly, there was one man who was hit especially hard by the production's collapse, Dan O'Bannon. At the end of all this, he was left broke and homeless in the middle of Paris, with no prospects for the future. After a stay in a psychiatric hospital, he moved in with his old friend Ronald Chousset and began writing script after script. It was while staying with Chousset and discussing film ideas that, together, they hit on an idea that O'Bannon developed into a screenplay. It went under various names like They Bite and Star Beast until it was purchased by 20th Century Fox, heavily rewritten by producers Walter Hill and David Geiler, and released as Alien. The film made from O'Bannon's script under the direction of Ridley Scott in 1979 wound up utilizing, coincidentally or not, nearly every key production talent jettisoned from the Dune team. Aside from O'Bannon, there was conceptual artist H.R. Giger, who designed the iconic Xenomorph, storyboard artist Mobius, and even Chris Foss contributed some early ship designs. It almost sounds like Ridley Scott may have been cannibalizing the remains of Dune's carcass, but it's also possible this was just happenstance. Scott is a genius in his own right, and if you're gonna design a sci-fi film, what better team could you get? And Scott's involvement in the Dune saga wouldn't just remain peripheral either. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's much evidence to suggest that even though Dune never actually came to fruition, its ethereal presence has resonated throughout the industry. Those proof-of-concept books that Jodorowsky assembled are said to have wound up in countless hands over the years, and some credit Jodorowsky's Dune with having influenced, directly or indirectly, almost every sci-fi film that came subsequently. And the ideas that Jodorowsky developed would not go to waste. Beginning in 1980, he would re-team with Mobius on an epic comic book series called The Inkal, based on much of their conceptual design for Dune. 
Being Call is frequently cited as one of the greatest comic books ever published, and has developed into its own expanded universe, referred to as the Jodoverse, with many additional comics and graphic novels. There have even been attempts to adapt the Ink Call itself as a feature. Canadian animator Pascal Blay created a short trailer for an animated version in the 80s, but apparently never managed to get the film into production. And there were rumors in 2013 that Jodorowsky's superfan Nicholas Winding Refn was planning a live-action version. But again, nothing happened. On a side note, French director Luc Besson was actually sued by the creators of the Incal after the release of his 1997 sci-fi film The Fifth Element, on which Mobius himself worked as a concept artist. The lawsuit claimed the film plagiarized their comic, and was eventually ruled in Besson's favor. Both Jodorowsky and Mobius would look back on their Dune experience positively, with Jodorowsky calling the film a wonderful failure, and Mobius insisting, for me, Dune was not a failure. The film remains what it should be, a mirage between the Dunes. But while Jodorowsky enjoyed continuing success in comics, his film career was faltering. A few years after Dune's cancellation, still very keen on making a children's film, he would travel to India to make Tusk. No relation to the Kevin Smith movie. This was an adventure film about a little girl who shares a spiritual connection with an elephant. Tusk was beset by production troubles, and the finished film basically went unreleased. To this day, it's almost impossible to see, except in very poor quality tape transfers. From the sounds of it, Jodorowsky would prefer to forget the whole thing, once declaring, don't see Tusk, I bury that film. This was followed by another brief career high with 1989's Santa Sangre, a horror film that teamed him up with producer Claudio Argento, who had produced many of the films of his older brother, Dario. Jodorowsky was granted full creative control, and the result was phenomenal. Santa Sangre tells the story of a traumatized boy raised in the circus who is forced by his insane, armless mother to act as her arms in the committing of a series of vicious murders. It's an outlandish psychological thriller that features some of Jodorowsky's most sensitive, emotional storytelling. In the midst of all the blood and gore, the surrealism and comedy, he conveys a real sense of loss and longing for childhood innocence. It's a beautiful film, and one of his most accessible. The following year, in 1990, his directing career was dealt an apparent death blow by The Rainbow Thief. Working for the first time as nothing more than a hired technician, Jodorowsky was put under strict creative restriction for this film by producer Alexander Salkind, whose wife, Berta Dominguez, had written the script. Jodorowsky was forbidden from changing a word of the screenplay, and forced to severely restrain his extravagant tendencies. This was the closest he ever came to making what you might call a Hollywood film, and it was his first and only time working with major international stars like Peter O'Toole, Omar Sharif, and Christopher Lee. The experience was possibly the worst of his career, and after all that, the film wound up sinking without a trace. To this day, it's almost as difficult to see as Tusk. Following this, Jodorowsky was effectively banished from the film industry, and his two most famous works would all but vanish with him. Remember when he abandoned Alan Klein in London? Well, Klein was so furious over Jodorowsky leaving him that he took both El Topo and the Holy Mountain completely off the market. For about 30 years, the films were tied up in a bitter legal battle and rendered effectively unseeable, except through crude, pirated VHS copies. Mostly, they just existed through word of mouth. Klein briefly continued trying to make the story of O, but eventually sold the rights. An adaptation was later made in 1975, under different producers and directed by softcore specialist Yust Yakin, the man behind the original Emmanuel, which had spawned a popular and long-running erotic film series. The story of O didn't enjoy the same success. The film was panned by critics and banned in Britain, but was apparently popular enough to earn a sequel in 1984, which was directed by one of the first film's producers, Eric Rochat. 
who coincidentally was also a producer on Jodorowsky's Tusk. For 23 years after The Rainbow Thief, Jodorowsky was unable to make a single film. He made several attempts to produce a sequel to El Topo, and in 2009 recruited David Lynch as a producer on a project called Kingshot, but both projects fell through. I'd like to cover each of them in their own episodes one day. Jodorowsky stayed busy writing books and comics and developing his own form of psychotherapy called Psychomagic. Then he finally made his return to filmmaking. In shockingly rapid order, Jodorowsky settled his decades-old feud with Klein, who put his previous work back on the market, the Dune documentary was released, and in 2013 he released the autobiographical The Dance of Reality, produced by his old friend and Dune collaborator, Michel Seydoux. The Dance of Reality was followed up with 2016's Endless Poetry, and Jodorowsky has plans to continue from there with a whole series based on his life. These two films demonstrate an enormous deepening of Jodorowsky's tenderness and humanity. Both are joyous, dazzling, nostalgic explorations of how experiences shape human beings, how our past places us on a spiritual path we're never able to properly see except in old age. If these wind up being Jodorowsky's last films, they'd be a pretty great way to go out. But despite now being in his 90s, he is showing no signs of slowing down. His most recent project was a documentary on his work with Psychomagic, titled Psychomagic, An Art That Heals. That brings us up to date on Jodorowsky, but the story of Dune is not yet finished. After Jodorowsky's production was cancelled, there were still four years remaining on the option that had been purchased for Dune's film adaptation. That option went up for sale, and very quickly, in 1976, it was purchased by Italian producer Dino De Laurentiis. And here is where we enter the next phase of the story. 